Good evening. Welcome to, to all of you who, who are with us in person and of course to all of our guests who are, who've joined us online. Um, welcome to the Japanese American National Museum, which is in the heart of Little Tokyo, and welcome to our Democracy Forum, which is in our National Center for the Pres Preservation of Democracy. This program tonight is important for many reasons, and we have an extraordinary panel um, that will lead us through this, the discussion and talk about why it was so seminal in the history of the city, why its influence was so profound in the city and why that influence and why what happened then 30 years ago still resonates today. And for Janum, that was also an extraordinarily important time. As Joy said earlier on, it's our 30th anniversary of when we opened to the public and our 30th anniversary is on April the 30th, which was the day, which was the day 30 years ago when the, the uprising started. And it was an extraordinarily important time for Janum because the museum, the, the vision of our founders was that Janum should be a museum, should be a place that would commemorate the history of what happened to Japanese Americans. It would be a place to conserve and preserve the stories, the artifacts, um, the history and the experiences of what happened to Japanese Americans. And the reason for that was that it should never happen to anybody else. So that was the primary impetus for Janum existing. But as Janum opened, 30 years ago, open to the public 30 years ago, we were birthed in that crucible of that uprising. And it completely changed Janum's approach. So our approach was to talk about, was to preserve the history, as I said, was to preserve the history. But after, after the events of, of April 30, it, was, it became incredibly important that that there was so much healing that needed to be done in the community. And there was an acknowledgement that Janum could play a very powerful role in that. And we embarked on a series of programs. In fact, we embarked our entire approach for looking at celebrating multiculturalism, celebrating diversity, grew out of that experience. And it was profound for Janum but it also was profound for the, for the museum world in this country. Because we were one of the first museums of its kind at that time, and we were the only museum that was looking at its history and looking at its programs using that intersectional approach. So Janum was way out there before anybody else was doing it. And fast forward, of course, 30 years later, and we look at where we've been in that continuum over the 30 years, and the great tragedy. The great tragedy is so, that so many, so many of those issues that were raw, that were tragic 30 years ago, continue to be with us, continue to be relevant, and continue to be urgent. So that we're all gathering here in our National Center for the Preservation of Democracy is really important because this is also a place where we bring people together to talk about issues of, of race, of equity, of justice, of identity, and also to talk about the fragility of America's democracy. So it's really important that we're here, that we're having this conversation. It's as relevant, the issues are as relevant now as they were 30 years ago, and they're just as urgent. So I'm going to pause there, and I am actually going to, again, on behalf of Janum, thank all of you for coming. We have an amazing panel with us tonight. Um, and I would also, I would like to start off, kick off our formal part of the program by introducing to you our moderator, um, Josie Wong, who reports for KPCC and LA List. And she focuses on the intersection of being Asian and American. And she worked for daily newspapers in New England before making the leap to Maine's public radio station as a host and a reporter. And then since moving to KPCC, her, beat, her beats have been immigration, housing, and religion. And of course, the rest is history. And we're just delighted that um, Josie can be moderating our panel for us this evening. So Josie, please come on up. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Anne, for this introduction, and Janim for putting this panel together, and Joy for doing all this organizing. And oh, can you hear me? Is that better? Oh, yes, a lot better. Okay, so let me just start over and say thank you, Anne, so much uh, for that introduction, and uh, Janim for holding this very important panel, um, you know, leading us into a week of observances and remembrances next week. Uh, next week being 429, uh, known in Korean as Saigu, uh, if I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, uh -huh. um, and uh, I'm very excited tonight that we get to hear from uh, this panel here where these are folks who have these very unique experiences and thoughts about the uprisings and their aftermath. So I'd like to introduce the panelists, starting with uh, Michael Lawson, who sits nearest to me. He is the president and CEO of the Los Angeles Urban League. He retired as a partner after 31 years with Skadden, Arp, Slate, Meager, and Flom. He is the former president of the LA Airport Commission and has served on the boards of charitable organizations, Loyola Marymount University and Morehouse College. He was a US ambassador to the International Civil, I Civil Aviation Organization for the Obama administration. Uh, next to Michael is Nadia Kim, who also has a connection to Loyola Marymount, in that she is a professor of Asian and uh, Asian American studies there. She researches, among other things, race and citizenship injustices relating to Asian Americans and South Koreans, as well as race and nativist racism in LA. Her books include the award-winning Imperial Citizens, Koreans and Race, From Seoul to LA, Nadia is also a longtime organizer on issues such as immigrant rights, affirmative action, and environmental justice. And last but not least is Angela O. Oh. She is an attorney mediator and Zen meditation instructor. Uh, when I greeted her today, she did this to me, um, <laughs> which is also very safe COVID-wise. She was trained as a criminal defense lawyer and worked as a civil rights organizer. After the 1992 uprisings, she became an outspoken voice on the underlying causes behind the uprisings and challenged prevailing media narratives. In 1998, she was among seven presidential appointees to President Clinton's One America Initiative on Race. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, so I don't know about you guys, but when you bring up the anniversary with people and mention that it was 30 years ago, uh, a lot of people can't believe it. Right? Um, it was literally a generation ago, and many of the younger people today uh, weren't even alive at the time of the unrest and may only know the contours of what happened. And what did happen April 29th, 1992? That day, a jury finished deliberating the case of four members of the LAPD charged in the brutal beating of Rodney King more than a year earlier. They were Sergeant Stacy Kuhn and officers Lawrence Powell, Theodore Bersano, and Timothy Wind, and all four men were acquitted that afternoon, and the unrest started within hours. Over the next five days, communities of color would be the hardest hit by the unrest, with a lot of the unrest centered in South LA and Koreatown. More than 50 people died, a disproportionate number of them black Angelinos. Thousands were injured. Across the city, thousands of businesses uh, were destroyed a disproportionate number of them Korean owned. There was a billion dollars in damage, is the estimate. Koreatown burned as communities such as Beverly Hills went unscathed. So what's happened in the 30 years since? Where are we now? I wanna ask our panelists about this and to delve into that, but first I was hoping I could get from you guys um, a recollection about the uprisings and I think I'll, I'll start with you Michael, um, can you tell us where you were in your life when the uprisings happened? Many people thought the the beating, the LAPD beating of Rodney King would be an open and shut case, and then all four members of the LAPD were acquitted by a nearly all white jury uh, in the suburbs. Do you remember where you were and what your reaction was at the time? I remember exactly where I was. Thank you very much for having me, by the way. Um, uh, this is an important a very important uh, milestone uh, because we've kind of gone through this again with George Floyd mm -hmm. uh, with a very different outcome. Uh, but yes, I remember exactly where I was. I was driving in my car listening to the radio and I heard the verdict and 
I had to pull over. Um, but at the same time, it wasn't unexpected. And that is what hurt more than anything else. Because of, I, I thought back to all of the, 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 the marches, all of the people who have given their lives to change the way in which uh, our communities are being treated. And to get another full acquittal with all of the evidence that was available. I mean, this, this was before cell phones that had cameras in them, and this gentleman filmed the entire thing, so there was no way to say this wasn't what it was. And they were acquitted. Um, and so it was a shock, but it wasn't a shock. Uh, it, was, it was only a shock because we had such high expectations for the country. And they let us down again. Uh, I was I was hoping that we wouldn't have an uprising following this, but at the same time, a part of me said, "How do we change things if we sit back and accept this? The the the, the loss of lives should n never ever have, have occurred, but there had to be some response." Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so that's where I was. And not more than 30 years ago, we had gone, the city had gone through this with the uprising in Watts, right? Well, you must have been a child, or did you remember that as well? 1963, I remember that as well. Yeah. Uh, similar types of circumstances, uh, similar response, um, and um, again, our communities were devastated more than any others, uh, and it it the 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 arc had been it is continuing to bend toward justice, but it is bending slowly. <laughs> but but the when you look at, I also remember where I was when the verdict about the murder of George Floyd was given. Mm -hmm. And there was just a sigh of relief, as opposed to joyful. It was a sigh of relief because we had seen it go the other way so many times. Mm -hmm. So yes, progress is being made. Um, and, and I'm old enough to remember 63. I'm old enough to remember 92. I'm old enough to remember things in between as well. Uh, are we making progress? Yes. Is it slow? Yes. Yeah. Um, and I want to ask yeah. you about, I want to hear about the progress because I, you know, we, we have been talking about how much has not changed, but I know there, you know, maybe the yardstick is moving a little bit um, for the, in the, the right direction. Um, Nadia, what about yourself? Uh, where were you um, at that, in 1992 when, when you heard about the verdict and when the uprising started? Yeah. Um, first of all, I just want to thank everyone and explain why I'm wearing the mask. As you can probably hear, my voice uh, has cold flu written all over it. Um, I'm not contagious, I promise. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks, Josie, for the question. Thanks, Michael. Um, I was actually, I like the age spread on this um, panel. I was actually a senior in high school. And I uh, had been watching uh, the Rodney King tape and the political discussion around that because um, that was actually the very first viral video, really. You know, we think of viral videos today as social media, what's on Twitter, et cetera. But um, this was the first video that um, really spread across what was a new 24 hour cable news network. And so. All of us who watched the video, myself included, um, even though we really didn't have enough discussions in high school about it, um, was that you know this was brutality, right? And for those of us who heard the verdict, as you were saying, Michael, with all the evidence, right? And the, this is the LAPD, right? And to all of them, the four white American officers to be acquitted, um, I just remember um, being quite surprised because, again, you thought that or we thought that it was overwhelmingly clear um, that it was unjustified violence. Not that, you know, 
um, I believe in a violent carceral state anyhow. But um, as a Korean American and as a Korean American woman, I remember also being very sort of, um, what's the word? Like my mind was kind of bent by the fact that for most of my life, I never saw myself represented on television, in magazines and newspapers, in the news. Um, you know, maybe a select caricature here or there across my, you know, 17, 18 year old life at that point. And to all of a sudden see Korean Americans front and center in relation to the probably the biggest um, news event of my life um, was certainly an out of body experience. And I think one of the main the main things that really struck me was that I really felt like Korean Americans, along with Black and Latinx groups as well, were being caricatured. You know. Um, on the, it was wonderful to see Angela O oh speaking, and you know she had sharp analysis, and she was certainly um, aware of the systemic and structural and cultural issues at hand. But on the other hand, you saw those constantly recycled images of um, Korean men with handkerchiefs on store tops, um, like AK-47 toting vigilantes, right, shooting indiscriminately, that was one. Another one was, um, you know, Korean American, usually it was middle-aged women who would just be shrieking and crying hysterically and nobody was translating what she was saying um, and not making the effort to really understand um, from her perspective. Um, you know, and there was images of just the, the conflict. It, it, you know, it became distilled into a black Korean conflict when clearly this problem was also related to the structural system of racism, right? And so it just felt, um, shocking, disembodying, um, and I just remember feeling a little bit um, like I wanted to do something and I wanted to help, but I lived about maybe, um, I don't know, 15, 20 miles north of um, the site of the unrest, and I also felt um, insulated. And, and so it's just a strange feeling when you're like, I should be out there or I should, I should be involved or doing something, and you're just kind of like, watching from your living room, you know, like for the first time your people are represented and it's in this manner. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, yeah. I wanted to ask, like yeah. I, you were in a senior and yeah. you went on to uh, become an Asian American studies <laughs> yeah. professor. I don't know if that is, did the uprisings help to turn you that mm -hmm. direction? That is an excellent question. That was the essay I wrote to get into the sociology PhD program at Michigan. I said, I want to study the unrest from a broader, more historical, um, more just and fair perspective than the way that it was portrayed, that in the media narrative, it goes from, uh, yeah, white American police are acquitted of police violence and brutality to uh, black and Korean Americans hate each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and it's yeah. like, that's the media, right? And that's the, if it bleeds, it leads discourse. And, you know, as in my introduction of you, Angela, you were very much about trying to redirect the media from just focusing on interracial tensions. But before I ask how you became this de facto sp spokesperson, not really of your own volition, um, where were you uh, the day the verdict was called and uh, you know, the uprising started? So in LA at the time, there were a number of leadership programs going on and the Jewish community had one called the New Leaders Program. And they were having a, I knew that the verdict uh, was going to be announced that day, but that evening, um, Reverend Cecil Murray was calling for people to come to the church and I had already committed to going to meet these young leaders at a Korean spot in K-Town. So I was there and finished my um, presentation and com conversation with them. And as I was leaving, um, I started seeing the city burn. I mean, in the bar area, the news was all about fires that were happening and people out on the streets. And it seemed like there was going to be some violence. And, I just thought, mm, I'm going to go home. <laughs> Went up to Mount Washington, turned on the news, and I saw uh, that the police weren't responding. People were 
clearly confused about where help was going to come from. And then um, I stayed up, I think, until 1 or 2 in the morning. And then I got up the next morning because I had a deadline. I had to get a petition up to Sacramento on a, on a woman who I had been um, representing in connection with her incarceration to get her released. There, there had been a change in the law around evidence that you could present for victims of domestic violence. So I was anxious to get my petition up because it was due that day. And in the building, they were telling us to get out of the building that people were coming up north from uh, South LA and they were coming into downtown and there was a lot of destruction that was happening. And it happened that I was the incoming president of the Korean American Bar Association at the time. So I went over to the president's office, which was just west of the Harbor Freeway on the 19th floor. And John Lim and I just, he was on the phone with uh, Rachel Young, who is the president of the African American Bar, Langston. And we had been working together anyway because of the Sunja Du case. There had been this particular tension. And so the black bar and the Korean bar, and a few of the other Asian bars, Java and the Chinese Lawyers Association, we kind of had this. Um, this network, and we were trying to work on um, reaching out to our communities to let them know what the system can and cannot do. And so we were on the phone, and I'm counting the fires, the open flames, because I could see from the 19th floor there were, you know, a dozen, two dozen fires going. And I, it was clear that nothing uh, was under control. And then John got a call from one of his clients. He's a business lawyer. And the client was uh, one of the Koreatown um, shopping center owners. So we decided to jump in his car and go there. I don't know what we thought we were going to do, but <laughs> we got there. I mean, we're a couple of lawyers. We're not going to stop people. But on the way, I'm really glad we went because on the way, you know, I could see who was on the street. And um, at least in the Koreatown area, it was a lot of poor people um, running into stores, grabbing food and grabbing, you know, appliances and, and dish racks and diapers. And I mean, and then I did see a lot of people um, on the street really angry and confused. I saw young men throwing bricks at buildings, um, throwing bricks into the store windows. Um, and my practice was a criminal defense practice, so I knew there was going to be a lot of arrests in the aftermath of this, but I didn't know how the system was going to handle it. Um, the whole time I'm just thinking, this isn't, this isn't real, but it was real. And uh, so, you know, as, I, as John and I got to the Koreatown Plaza, they were in a panic about, you know, how they're going to protect that property. I don't even remember what, what happened there, but I do remember that Rachel and her executive committee and John and our executive committee decided to have a press conference, but nobody came. Hmm. Nobody came because they were covering the fires, they were covering things like Reginald Denny being pulled out of his hmm. truck and being beaten to a pulp, they were covering folks overturning police um, vehicles in front of Parker Center, and everybody was asking where the police chief was. It was just chaos. Mm -hmm. And you, at that time, I'm guessing, knew that you were going to have, um, you know, a wagon full of cases or work to do in the, in the days and months ahead related to the uprisings to help the Korean American community. But it sounds like you became, um, you know, plucked, you, you were plucked out of the, uh, a, a bunch of names and kind of became a go-to voice for the Korean American community. It all started with a call, right, from the producers of yes, Nightline? Yes, ABC. Yeah. ABC. There was a, a young woman named Clara, um, and she um, was, a, I think she was a PA or something, and she uh, told her, I guess, manager, you need to have a Korean voice out here, because it was kind of shocking, actually. I was you know, a supporter of some of our black political leaders and the things that they were saying in the media were just, for me, like, this isn't real. It was so, um, it was so uh, hostile and I would think towards to myself, the yeah, toward Cor Koreans, I mean, just generally, basically, um, 
to say you can't come into our community and just take stuff out of here and, and not give anything back. And I thought, wow, this is really a deep, deep issue here. We need to like get into a conversation. And so um, when Clara called, she said, look, there's this program, Nightline. I never even watched Nightline, but she said, you need to go on. There's this guy, Ted Koppel, he'll talk to you. So I went on and I was angry, you know, and I just said, I do not accept this narrative that you guys are putting out there in the, in the, this is the burning in LA. Thank you, President Bush, because you've driven us into a recession. You are ignoring the fact that we got problems with police community relations. You are not p helping to provide the kind of leadership that this country with its changing demographic needs. And, um, you're not going to tell me, as a Korean American born and raised in LA, that all of this is happening because blacks and Koreans can't get along. I mean, I, I cop to the fact that there is a particular tension. I did a lot of public speaking after mm -hmm. the five days, mm -hmm. and I would get asked, what's wrong with you Korean people? How come we didn't have this problem with the Japanese? We didn't have this problem with the Chinese. We didn't have this problem with the Jews. Koreans, we have this problem. And what is it? And then there were all these, I think, urban myths about who Korean people are that got believed and repeated over and over again. And in the backdrop, by the way, was the Sunja Du trial mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the death, the murder, really. It was a homicide mm -hmm. of, uh, of Latasha. Latasha. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, but I, I have a beef with that, too, to this day. Because um, and, and before we move on, for folks who aren't familiar with the case, Latasha Harlins was a 15-year-old right. um, uh, young black woman who was uh, accused she was of 15-year-old. Yes, yeah. um, that's right, an adolescent, and she was accused of shoplifting um, by uh, Sunja Sun Du, and um, there was a scuffle, and Sunja Du ended up shooting Latasha in As the she back. Was leaving in the back of her head. She I understand was. that her body. Her body was found, her still holding $2 that she had to pay for the orange juice she was accused of uh, trying to steal. And so I, I just wanted to put that reset there, but go on. Yeah, so that, that case actually was the thing that really made a lot of people angry. Because at the time, and this part of the story often is forgotten, there was a case involving someone who had kicked a dog, and that person got six months in custody. Right? It's a misdemeanor, but mm -hmm. in the case of the death of this child, really, there was no uh, jail time, right? Mm -hmm. Now, as a criminal defense lawyer, I will also admit, I thought, wow, that's an extraordinary sentence because she actually followed the sentencing rules, which judges don't necessarily do. They're supposed to take into consideration mm -hmm. the offense characteristics. This is the worst offense. You've taken a human life but also the offender characteristics, so that if this is a person who has little or no chance of reoffending, if this is a person who has no criminal history, if this is a person who, as in this child uh, trial, was shown to have uh, emotional and mental distress, um, what we would call PTSD today, trauma, triggering events, um, you know, she did the right thing, but I don't think that people understood, like, where's that compassion for a uh, black defendant, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist in, in the, the criminal legal system as far as I could see at that point. Mm -hmm. Michael, I wanted to ask you about the timing of the killing of Latasha Harlins by Sunja Du. It was, um, I think the, her death occurred the same month as the beating of Rodney King by LAPD. It was and a couple weeks after. It, it was, yeah. yes, it was within weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and so you had these two incidents timed so closely together. Mm -hmm. And um, as Angela was describing, many leaders in the black community voiced anger and hostility. Uh, I mean, I, when you think back about how did, how did the Latasha Harlan's um, killing, murder, um, contribute or fan what was going on with the the unrest after the verdict for um, the LAPD case? It was huge. It was huge. It, it was um, in a kind of a, a double slap in the face uh, to our community. Um, and, and, but you have to understand that, that uh, it goes 
way beyond just that incident. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about uh, the Korean, um, uh, it, it, the, the, the interchange between the two communities, you look at the black community, which has suffered from uh, racial covenants, not being able to even buy a home, having uh, limited access to capital and investment and, and, and loans and so on and so forth. And you, th 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 there's a resentment when you see this other community coming in and being able to uh, own a liquor store or whatever, or a small store, what have you, and we can't get that kind of economic support for uh, the businesses that we want to start. And that money that goes into those stores doesn't stay in the community. Um, you know, I'm not saying that people were walking around <laughs> reading their economic books and saying, oh, this is happening, that's happening, but this, the feeling was there. That, um, that, that, that these, these groups are not part of our community. And to double down on that with this, with 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 this shooting and, and and the lack of what we felt was a necessary type of of uh, th there had to be some punishment, mm -hmm. and to see that um, just caused everything to bubble up. Mm -hmm. um, but but make no mistake, it wasn't just one incident. Mm -hmm. uh, it was. Uh, moving into a neighborhood, you, when you talk about the riots in 1963, we, uh, I, I was born in Arkansas, and my family moved to Los Angeles in 1962, and we moved to a neighborhood that was, uh, quite frankly, uh, very eclectic. Uh, and shortly after we moved in, most of the non-black people in that community moved out, and that's. Los Angeles is one of the most segregated cities mm -hmm. in the country, and and so you 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 have that type of of interaction or lack of interaction, and the again the lack of access to capital, lack of access to credit, and you see that that's not the same thing. That's not the same thing that's happening uh, in other communities. And don't get me wrong, we we admire what the Korean community has done, mm -hmm. what the Japanese community has done. And we want to, quite frankly, um, follow that lead. Mm -hmm. But also, you have to understand that we had that. Mm -hmm. You look at Greenwood, the district in Tulsa that was called Black Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Three black-owned banks in that district, multiple um, uh, movie studios, the, it was burned down because it was so effective and economically uh, vital. And it was more than the, just that one. There were Greenwoods throughout the United States. And there's a book called, uh, and I forget the name, I'll, I'll give you the name of it before I leave, but uh, it's a book that, that chronicles what happened in between 1919 and 1921 when white mobs came and destroyed our townships mm -hmm. like that. And as, as, as the economists on this panel know, losing is, is much worse than a small game. And so these, the, 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 it's not just trauma. It was just the complete devastation and so that sort of, not sort of, that, that is a part of the, the unspoken discussion when we see community people coming into our communities and, and thriving. We're not mad at you. We're 
pissed off that we had that, that, that the roadblocks for us were still there. Mm -hmm. And and I'm mindful of the fact too that um, while you were seeing um, an influx of immigrant business owners, that there were other pressures on South LA. Jobs were leaving, uh, record unemployment. You were seeing demographic change with immigrants coming from Latin America, competition for jobs, and then to add to that, you're not seeing the investment in the community from newcomers. Right? Um, and, and Nadia, because of your your research, I want to mm -hmm. ask you about why this this dynamic, and you know there. Have have been Asian Americans living alongside um, Black Americans mm -hmm. for a long time in uh, Los Angeles, and uh, if you could talk about, you know, Korean Americans by the time of the uh, the uprisings, Korean Americans were probably having the most daily interaction um, with mm -hmm. uh, members of the Black community, and mm -hmm. they are not the largest Asian diaspora by far at all in LA. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about, give us some um, historical context for how this dynamic came to be? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, um, you know, one thing I'll say is that Los Angeles was experiencing, as you guys are saying, massive demographic shifts, right? Because most immigrants, we have to remember, from Asia, Latin America, and then there's the Caribbean, et cetera, came after 1970, right? And um, so to put it in a broader context, they're starting to come in, right? Lots of um, immigrants from Korea, for example, coming in in the 70s, 80s. And at the same time, you have... Uh, Reagan, right, and Reaganomics take hold, and that is the starting point of all of these major racialized and economic problems you guys have been naming. You know, we call it, uh, we put it under the fancy term neoliberalism, and, and all we're saying with neoliberalism is that essentially the market is given the power to dictate everything, okay? Um, you start gutting the social welfare programs and the social welfare state on which groups of color, black Americans, Latinx, right, um, and also immigrants are most dependent on. And you basically say, uh, we're going to let um, corporations, Wall Street, industry run away with profit, um, power, right? And um, this is what's also causing massive racialized and economic injustices and inequalities within LA, okay? Uh, in addition to all the problems you named, Josie, there was also um, massive over-policing and the starting of the prison industrial complex, right? Um, the crack cocaine epidemic. I mean, all of this is happening. And so it's a powder keg, right? And it's so interesting listening to Angela because even though there was like commentary from the community that we didn't have any issues with Jews or, when you look at the history of ethnic merchants in in black American communities in the United States, there was always conflict. It, there was conflict with the Jewish merchants. There was conflict with the Italian-American merchants. And it's, yes, some of it is because of interpersonal and cultural, and of course, the economic inequality between the merchants and the clients. But it's also because you have two groups that are marginalized in some way, shape, or form being pitted against each other for crumbs, right? And in the 90s, 1980s and thereafter, it gets even worse, much, much worse. And so with, with Koreans and black Americans, that's the context into which they enter. Now, the difference between Koreans and the white American merchants, right, southern eastern European immigrant merchants, is that Koreans don't speak English or don't speak it as well, right? Um, Koreans come from a non-European country, so you know their cultural practices are different. Um, they weren't seen as quite American or as culturally Americanized as the Southern Eastern European immigrants, and you know, frankly, the norms are different, right? Um, as many of you know, norms of service and whether you go to restaurants or shopping, it's quite different in Asia, and that's what immigrants are bringing over, you know? As a quick example, uh, if you go to Korea, it's normative for clerks and uh, sales associates to follow you. That's just the nature of it, right? So some of it was also that that was happening in LA. It wasn't all, you know, suspicion of robbery, though that's also there too, right? And... Um, you know, just to wrap up, because I don't want to, you know, there's, we can talk about this later, but in my own work um, that I started in graduate school as a grad student, what I argued is that we need to address the um, broader global and historical relationship between the United States and South Korea to really understand how um, 
notions, ideologies, stereotypes about Koreans came into being on the part of Americans, and then how Koreans started thinking about black Americans, okay? So U.S. imperialism meant the U.S. expanding its empire into South Korea after World War II, and what Koreans witnessed was Jim Crow segregation in the military, right? Caricatures of black Americans in the military network, the TV network, right? And what African Americans witnessed of Koreans was a dependent, feminized, third world nation that was dependent on the United States military and prowess. And we need to understand that global and imperialistic context as well as part of their first encounter. No, thank you for bringing that global yeah. context mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You know, despite these huge cultural gaps, Angela, I understand that you know the the killing of Latasha Harlins was widely condemned within uh, the Asia, uh, the Korean American Asian American community. Uh, there was widespread shock when she was just given probation by the judge, and I and I still hear her name a lot uh, within um, you know Asian amongst uh, Korean American leaders. Um, talking about the injustice um, that was uh, given out. But I, I want to take your temperature on where you think um, the relations stand right now between you know, the Asian or specifically the Korean American communities and uh, Korean American community and the black communities. I know that you have been part of a lot of the dialogue um, between two groups you're part of. I understand like a API black healing circle. Uh, you are... Um, you know, a part of these different groups trying to find, you know, areas of alliance, unity, uh, and where do you think things stand now, also given the context, the backdrop of where, you know, both communities have been quite battered during the pandemic um, with regards to trauma experienced um, for the black community, and uh, specifically regarding policing, uh, over-policing, excessive use, and, you know, out of that is of course came um, Black Lives Matter, which of course has ex existed for years, but really became even more emergent during the pandemic. And as for Asian Americans, during the last couple of years, they've seen an increase in anti-Asian hate crimes, uh, attacks, and so. 30 years later, we are talking about these two communities again, and they've been through a lot. And, and so how do you think what's happened during the pandem pandemic plays into mm. where we stand today? I know that's a lot. Mm. <laughs> in, in the most succinct way, I will say that people who are in positions of leadership in their respective communities have um, educated themselves and have found ways to bridge, but I think at the ground level, things haven't changed a whole lot. I think there's a lot of tension still out there. I think it is um, not common for people to feel warmth toward the other. There hasn't been enough uh, uh, education healing. Um, I got very angry when I, I saw uh, one of our city council members compare Sunja Du to the Klan in the killing of Emmett Till. Uh, I just thought it was outrageous to was go Was this there. recent or? This was when we had the commemorative uh, naming of the park in LA, Marquise's district. And he made a comment that I just thought was so uh, off. You cannot compare Sunjat Du to the Klan. She is not a Klan member. And to say that uh, she is among, you know, those who, um, who are examples of the kind of violence um, and to name her in the same idea even as the Klan to me was way off. And I, so there's a leader and I know he's trying to be responsive to his constituent base. Um, you know, I was just in a conversation this morning where uh, one of the people said, as, as a 29-year-old black man in, Ameri in L.A. in 92, when that decision came out, we all held when Sun Jadu was given probation, but we were angry. We were angry. Young black men in particular were very angry. Uh, we waited because our community leaders were saying, just wait. Justice will be served. And it wasn't when the officers were acquitted across the board. And he said, in no uncertain terms, yeah, we got our guns, we got in a car, we wanted to go to Koreatown and destroy it. We filled up pans of gasoline, we made Molotov cocktails, we were looking for Korean stores, and we wanted to destroy Koreatown. Now, as a 60-year-old man today, do I think that's the right thing to do? No. 
but you got to understand that in that moment, we were enraged, and there was nothing going to stop us. Now, here's the tie into anti Asian violence today. I'm seeing the same thing with the young Asian men who have decided that it's going to be necessary for them to get firearms, and if one more of our elders gets attacked, we're going to go and find uh, African American and, and do some damage. So you see this mentality of us and them, it's still very much alive, I think, and it's dangerous. Right now, this museum has a, a Bible and you know sutra exhibit going on, which I think is great. Um, so as long as we're in this space of duality, us and them, and we cannot get to we, then we're going to be in trouble, because it can only lead to violence. That's the only place it can go. And that's why we created, after George Floyd, the Black API Healing Circle. It grew out of a solidarity network that was started by two formerly incarcerated men, one black, one Asian, Billy Tang and Tim um, Court, Tim Court, I'm sorry, I just know him as Tim. <laughs> He's going to give me a hard time. Cornegay, that's his there last you name. There go. Uh, and Tim and Billy came together because of a video that they saw of a young Asian man in a knitted mask, full face cover, except for the eyes, loading several guns and saying, we need to call out the OGs because we need to take care of our people. See, who is our people? This is our people, not just this is our people. Mm -hmm. But as long as the understanding is we got our people and then they're their people. But the problem is that's the reality on the street, even now, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. even now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, the Healing Circle, it's been going for two years. We thought it was going to be a four-week training. It's been going on for two years. People don't want to leave it. Mm -hmm. And we don't talk about race all the time. Sometimes we just talk about needing to compost some things that happened in our life this week, you know? Mm -hmm. And this is where relationships get built. I mean, I know we're on this program, and maybe there's some people are listening out there, a few people are in here, but, you know, we're past the sage on the stage reality. Mm -hmm. People need to, like, not look for the answers out there because they're in here, and that's the, the hardest place to go, right? Because people <coughs> don't know how to do that. Here's how we're trained in America when it comes to education. We're told to sit down and be quiet in school, right? Ever since we're like this big, all the way through university. Whenever, it's like cell memory. When you sit down and you're told to be quiet, you expect somebody to feed you. <laughs> Whether it's a movie, a performance, a lesson for the day. That sitting down and being quiet is not an invitation to go in and see who am I. And this is the thing that has to happen. Michael, can I ask you about this uh, duality that Angela is describing or the oppositional relationship that you know, uh, black Americans and Asian Americans can sometimes find themselves in or you know, positioned that way, be it through media narratives or whatnot, or through online conversations um, by angry people um, about what's happening to, say, their elders. Uh, you know, I know you are going to be involved in uh, different events related to 429, uh, organized by leaders from both communities, but what about on the ground? What are you seeing? Um, Los Angeles is one of the most segregated cities in the United States. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you can literally get into your car, or get up in the morning, have your breakfast, go into the garage, get into your car, start the engine, and lock the doors before you open the garage door. And you don't have to interact with anyone until you drive into your office in, uh, in, in your car. You, th this is one of the most uh, uh, integrated cities and one of the most segregated cities. There are, there are almost every ethnic group in the, the world is, has, has a representation here, and we don't interact at all. Um, that and, and, and you compare that to New York City, where that subway is forces people to interact with one another. So that's part of the issue here. 
there is no interaction. Uh, and the fact is that the powers that be, which are prim primarily white, are happy with that. Because as long as we are fighting, we're not watch watching what they're doing. So, um, so, 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 so Reagan can raise the, uh, the, 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 basically for for colleges, raise the rates for going to college, for getting into college, and it happens. Um, so many things, the the the, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant is shrinking in terms of the, the percentage of them to the rest of the, the, the country, but they still, they're still still in power. Why? Because we're fighting one another. And as, if once we look at one another and say, no, we're not, the, we're not each other's enemy, mm -hmm. until that happens, mm -hmm. they can sit there and, and, and try to steal an election mm -hmm. and pretend like, oh, we got more votes than we actually did. Um, and, and so there is some, uh, there, there, there is some benefit to a portion of this population that wants us to continue to fight, mm -hmm. wants us to continue to be at each other's throat because they don't want to give up what they had stolen in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so, focused on filming blacks and Asians against each other with the COVID-19 racism, right? Political scientist Janelle Wong shout her out, you know, and their team have shown that the largest number of perpetrators aggressing against Asian Americans during COVID-19 were white American. But you wouldn't know that, right? Would not know that. Yeah. And I've actually mm -hmm. asked about L.A. Uh, yeah. You know, African Americans mm -hmm. are not the largest mm -hmm. uh, percentage of mm -hmm. perpetrators. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I can't speak for other parts of the country, but mm -hmm. unfortunately, you know, in LA, it's equal opportunity mm -hmm. in terms of uh, um, you know the anti-Asian uh, attacks in terms of who the perpetrators are. Mm -hmm. But you know, going off what you were saying, that uh, you know, we've been talking about these uh, interracial conflicts, but you know, what led to the uh, powder keg going off mm -hmm. in 1992 mm -hmm. was the systems and the decisions mm -hmm. made by the systems. Mm -hmm. You know, it was mm -hmm. you know uh, Latasha Harlan's case was decided by a judge, mm -hmm. uh, a jury um, that was uh, I. Think Think out in the Ventura, I think it was the one. Simi sorry, Valley. Simi Valley was where the one. A lot of police officers lived from right. the LAPD. They were selected yeah. and they mm -hmm. made the decision to acquit all four officers. And uh, I, I want to use what time we have left to discuss also just the police system because, you know, Michael, you you mentioned there has been some progress made, and after the uh, uprisings, there was, uh, you know, there were there was an investigation, right, into it. Um, the police chief at the time stepped down under pressure. I understand about 10 years after the uprisings, the city entered into a federal consent decree to address a lot of police abuses. But we were still having the same conversations as Nadia mentioned. You know, the Rodney King video beating of Rodney King was the first of more viral videos to come, mm -hmm. which have some of them have taken place in LA. Mm -hmm. So, where did you think we were going to be uh, farther along when it come when it came to policing in this city, or is this about where you thought it would be? Because you mentioned it was a slow bend uh, towards progress. Um, we are not where we should be, but the consent decree worked to be perfectly candid. Um, a, a number of African Americans were, uh, got into uh, LAPD, and it was because of the consent decree. When the consent decree stopped, the recruitment of African Americans stopped as well. And so you have a significant number of the African American uh, police officers are closer to retirement than, um, uh, than, than, than any other group. So the LAPD is now uh, a slight majority Hispanic, uh, but the number of African American officers is dwindling and many of them are close to retirement age. So um, uh, without the consent decree, the, the, I've heard all kinds of reasons why the, the LAPD has difficulty recruiting uh, black officers, but I keep reminding them, you, you seem to be able to do it when the consent decree was out. So don't tell me that, that this is impossible. Don't tell me that it's because people don't want to join the, the police department. Don't tell me that 
uh, it's um, the city's personnel department. It somehow it was able to get done, and and when you weren't watch when they weren't watching, uh, that stopped. So there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work that has to be done. Mm -hmm. We have to have a police department that looks like the people that they're policing. And, and, and there's no two ways about it, and we have to make that happen. There are a lot of forces that are pushing against that, uh, but we, we have to continue to, to, to fight. The, the, the fact of the matter is progress has been made. Mm -hmm. It's not as much as it should be. It's not as much as it's going to be. Um, but, but we won't stop. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we'll continue to push forward and, and, and make this city what it should be. Given the diversity that is in this city, we should be uh, the jewel of, of not only the state, but, but uh, the, the, the United States and, 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 and the world because of the, the, the diversity. Um, that is within uh, yeah. uh, that is within this city and in, in this county. Right. Um, I'm sorry. No, but I hear you about like uh, you know the legacy of the consent decree was you know adding diversity to the police ranks. Even though I do hear what you're saying too about um, black officers or black members of the force dwindling. Um, I, and the other thing I've noticed is more. I'm wondering if this is the legacy of the uprisings that I've seen more Asian Americans join. Um, you know, policing, mm -hmm. and um, maybe Nadia, I can ask you about this legacy because when I have reported in Koreatown in the past and asked about uprisings, I sense a lot of bitterness and resentment still about how Koreatown was allowed to burn when mm -hmm. other places were being protected. Mm -hmm. And how has that uh, affected attitudes towards policing? Do you think in the um, Korean American community, mm -hmm. uh, did it? Did harden folks or or not? Because I, I don't actually. I'm sorry, I don't know the numbers of oh, no, Koreans okay. joining the um, mm -hmm. police force. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's multitudes, but uh, there are there are folks mm -hmm. who do support mm -hmm. um, the LAPD. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely think that um, because of um, basically the local, state, and federal government uh, deciding to um, let Koreatown become scorched earth, you know, um, that it was not just a hardening of um, beliefs and um, attitudes towards policing, but I think it was towards the state in general. And um, as you mentioned, Josie, one of the results is that Korean Americans finally realized, many of them, um, some had already seen this, that we have to stop seeing ourselves um, as guests in someone else's country and internalizing the racialized foreignness that the white American supremacist system has imposed on us, right? And that we actually have to be agentic at the center um, and become uh, either civic leaders involved in the political electoral system um, or we have to organize, right, and be involved with organizing Korean and, for example, uh, other communities in K-Town, like especially Latinx, which makes up the majority of K-Town, right? And um, one of the most renowned um, grassroots community organizations uh, that came out of that was Kiwa, right? Uh, it's now called Koreatown Immigrant Workers Alliance. And their belief was they should get compensation, not just for the Korean immigrants whose businesses had burned to the ground, who had no insurance because they couldn't afford it, um, and got zero compensation from the U.S. government, even though the government uh, made sure to protect uh, Westwood and Beverly Hills. Okay, nobody went there. Okay, they had tanks. Um, and um, they recognized that, Kiwa recognized that we need to get compensation for the workers who worked in the K-Town businesses who lost everything as well, right? Many of them, not just Korean, but Latinx. And so um, in terms of I like to call it a racial baptism by fire because I think that's what it really was, you know? And it really awoke Korean Americans, not just in LA, um, but Korean and other Asian Americans uh, who could be mistaken for Korean, right? Or um, have some uh, alliance with them of some kind in other cities. So you saw uprisings or resistance in Chicago, in New York, et cetera. And um, I do think that Korean Americans have um, undergone tremendous change. So back in the 80s, the Reagan, the Bush days, right, when the Korean American first generation was kind of calling the shots more, right, they were voting quite conservative, 
Okay, many were members or affiliated with the Republican Party. I mean, Korean America has made this sharp left turn and really quickly too, and have become very committed to uh, being on the left or Democrats. And it's, I do think we have to attribute that to this like moment of reckoning, right, in 92 and, and its ripple effects thereafter. Mm -hmm. I do notice that a lot of the younger Korean American yes. politicians are a Democrat. We do have two Republican Korean American Congresswomen, Michelle Steele, yes. young, young Kim, of course, but uh, I, you know, they are of a different generation and Orange County. It, it, also, they're in Orange <laughs> County. That's correct. Uh, you know, one thing I've noticed in covering Asian American communities in Southern California is this rise in civic engagement mm -hmm. that you're talking mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. and it's very, very noticeable in LA. Mm -hmm. Where at one point you had two Korean, Korean Americans sitting on the City Council, uh, which in all its history has only ever had four uh, Asian American council members, and uh, there was also a great deal of organizing in Koreatown around redistricting mm -hmm. this last round. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, you know, there was a neighborhood council vote, I don't know if you guys remember this from several years ago, that broke turnout records for the city of LA. And, um, you know, Angela, I want to ask you about just Koreatown, uh, it seems like you know, it was re it's rebuilt, it's thriving. I mean, it's facing gentrification pressures, of course, uh, and you know, it's it's got its own struggles. But the Korean American community, I I've spoken to folks who have described Koreatown to me as like the heart of Korean America, not just for you know LA, but for you know Korean America, for the the you know the whole uh, American diaspora here. And uh, you know, was there something? Uh, was it the the uprisings? Did that help to consolidate and make people feel more protective? about preserving this neighborhood or which you know as um, Nadia mentioned is not even majority uh, Asian, Asian yeah. at this point not, but I mean yeah. I, I can't answer that question I really can mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I don't know you know, I know oh, sorry go ahead oh, I know that most of the big fancy stuff that you see is mm -hmm. foreign investment yeah it's from, from Korea, Korea. so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know I, I can't I can't get down with that really mm -hmm. I don't know where that narrative comes from yeah uh, but it just could be because I'm old. <laughs> yeah. What do you have? Do you have thoughts about this? Well, one? I was just going to add that. Yeah. I mean, some things is timing. Some things are luck. You know, um, around the time that um, Koreatown had to rebuild from the blighted buildings, burnt down, scorched, um, you know, areas, and the gnarled metal. You know, it was about the uh, start of the massive ascendancy of South Korea, mm -hmm. right? And global capitalism already had been taking off, right, since about the 80s. And so a lot of people think, oh, this was the ingenuity or the resources of individual ethnic merchants. And really, it was um, very wealthy transnational capitalist elites, right, who were then taking advantage of depressed real estate values, right, taking advantage of this whole globally restructured economy where you now have crisscrossing investment and, you know, developing and capital um, being poured in. And, um, yeah, and Korea is able to take its multinational corporations and plant them into K-Town and rebuild it, right? But interestingly enough, you know, as we've already mentioned, uh, K-Town is not majority Asian or Korean. And I mean, part of the reason why things probably cooled also is because there was Korean flight as well as black flight, you know? So you had in the area from South LA, what we used to call South Central, right? Black Americans are starting to go to San Bernardino County, right? Riverside. Um, and also moving to the South of the United States. And so were Korean Americans. Korean Americans are kind of starting to move to the South and everywhere else. And so, you know, we'd love to romanticize and say, oh, you know, we uh, held hands, sang Kumbaya, went to church together and, shared each other's food, and yes, that happened. And those things do matter. I'm not mocking tactile, everyday um, relations and healing, but um, at the same time, we have to understand that demographics were also kind of feeding like a calmer, less in your face, contentious kind of a setting. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the demographic change and mm -hmm. the flight from LA, uh, you know, I, I was curious, Michael, if you thought that 
Many of the uh, black Angelinos who did leave South LA in the aftermath of the uprisings, how much of it had to do with the the unrest and and you know just the uh, you know the impact it left on the area? How much did it have to do with the the economy and just like the struggle for jobs that sent people to you know northern LA County to Lancaster to Palmdale? Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's hard to, well, the fact of the matter is that the prices were going up and <laughs> opportunities were uh, available elsewhere and, you know, if, if you've got a car, you can drive uh, a longer, uh, take a longer commute. Um, the fact of the matter is that, that we aren't as balkanized as we were physically, but we're still balkanized mentally. Uh, so the, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, we we are still not um, reaching out to one another and and, and and getting to know one another in a way that uh, allows us to understand who we are and wh who we want to be in 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 this, in this world. We're, we're still balkanized. We're still even though redlining is not there, uh, and even though uh, we have communities that are integrated, we're still not reaching out. Mm -hmm. And, and with, with social media, you don't even have to talk to anyone that you, you don't think has the same mindset as yours. So we're actually going in, in, in the wrong direction to a certain extent, which makes it all the more important for people who you have on this panel speaking out and being that voice that says, no, this is, um, we, we have to reach out. I mean, when we, when I t took the position at the, the Los Angeles Urban League, um, uh, I got a call from, uh, uh, with respect to other eth uh, ethnic groups that we wanted to talk about some of these various issues. And I got pushback from my own staff. And I said, no, this is what we have to do. And it wasn't like this was a hard conversation. Uh, there, everybody said, you're right. This is what we should do. But, but if you're not hearing that, if all you're hearing is the negative stuff, is all, if all you're hearing is we have to be, it has to be us against them, and you don't hear the rational uh, discussion that you would normally get when you know we had um, uh, network television as opposed to the, the, the narrow conversations that you have on your, on your iPhone, uh, you, you, you only hear that one voice. And you think that everybody is, is hearing that same voice, and they're not. And it's up to us to make sure that they hear what we're saying. Make sure that, that, that they understand that, yes, Black Lives Matter, and it is not because we think other lives don't. And we, 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 we want, there has to be a, a, a coalition of all of these groups, of all of us, in order to move this entire country forward. This is, as long as we're pitted against one another, um, the, 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 the organizations that want us to fail Succeed. Succeed. There's no question about it. There's yeah. no question about it. We have, for the first time, we will have in June or July, a black female on the Supreme Court. It should not have taken this long. But every little step is important. Every little step is important. We need to, we need to have an Asian male or female on the Supreme Court. There's no question about that as well. And that has to happen. But it won't if we're just hearing um, the echoes of, of the ignorant and, and, and unsubstantiated statements um, that are floating around. Mm -hmm. Panels like this are important. Mm -hmm. Panels like this are critical. And I want to thank you for inviting me uh, mm -hmm. so we can have this conversation. Yeah. We have to have more of this. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, but first, I know that we have an audience here uh, that may want to have some, uh, may have some questions uh, that they want to pose. Is that right? Yeah, I think we'll 
texted you one of the questions. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, I haven't, I, I don't see the question, unfortunately. Oh, really? Okay. Um, yeah, why don't you go ahead first? And yeah, uh, I have a real quick question. Uh, what makes these political, economic, social times time so dark, so very dark? Mm -hmm. And what's your solution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something I wanted to ask about solutions here. How do we get yeah. this? <laughs> um, well, I wanted to just say maybe something a little bit sanguine. I know um, these times are dark and they are um, traumatizing, you know. Um, but at the same time, uh, just to let you guys know, so um, I did a study with Professor Sylvia Zamora from Loyola Marymount with the Center for the Study of LA, also from Loyola. And what's interesting is that Sometimes it takes these kinds of events or the arc of these events over time, right, that culminates in something like a brutal, um, you know, lynching, essentially, of George Floyd in Minneapolis for Americans uh, of all racialized groups to understand that there's structural racism, right? That there's uh, institutional, systemic, white American supremacy. And the reason why that's so important is, as a social scientist, you know, when you look at all the public opinion data and the survey data, so much of it is individualized, right? And we live in, in a society that sort of uses the social unit of individualism, and that racism is, is just um, prejudice, or racism is just just hate, um, you know, which is why I, I take issue with the word hate, um, because really it's not addressing the systemic causes, right, that led to something like the unrest and that led to the murder of George Floyd. So to me, I know it sounds very, very pie in the sky, but I do, and, and people might come from different political angles here, but I do believe we need to work towards systemic change. You know, we need to start effectively dismantling neoliberal racial capitalism, which puts these merchants and these low-income residents together, which basically is um, saying, it's, you know, it's hyper-individualism now. We don't need a social welfare state. We don't need social work. We don't need, you know, any kinds of government programs. How you do is all on you. You sink or you swim. And it's all based on your own merit or lack thereof, you know. And I do think that we need to get rid of a system, as Michael was saying, that not just benefits in terms of maintaining white supremacy, but um, that economically benefits, right, by maintaining a system that is premised on pitting, um, unequally hierarchizing, right, various racialized groups of color against each other, immigrant versus native-born groups of color, et cetera, et cetera. And I think if, if we can do the everyday work, right, um, given that neoliberalism means, you know, we don't even give social services anymore, basic social services, obviously that on a day-to-day -day level is very important, right? Um, uh, and even the Black Panthers are doing that, right? Free breakfast programs, right? But at the same time, we need to work towards dismantling the system itself. And, and the reason why maybe it's not too pie in the sky is because I'm amazed at the fact that AOC is an elected official. I really, I'm amazed that Bernie Sanders almost won the Democratic nomination. I'm amazed that you have so many Gen Z folks, not just millennials, but Gen Z folks who are anti-capitalist and wanting to replace it with something better. You know, I never thought I'd live to see that in my lifetime, honestly. <laughs> But at the same time, when George Floyd was being murdered, mm -hmm. there was an Asian officer right there. Yes, exactly, total. Mm -hmm. And he didn't do anything, not because he wanted to see him die. No. It's because the system mm -hmm. forced him to be silent. Mm -hmm. And part of what we have to do is raise our voices and say, no, this is not right. Mm -hmm. We have to be willing to stand up and say that what we're doing is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I remember I, 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 I was in a room with um, some LAPD officers who were talking with community organizers about uh, of several different things. And this one officer said, well, when I see one of my fellow officers do something that I know is wrong, I don't see anything. I let the higher-ups deal with that. 
And I pulled him aside after the event and I said, no, that cannot be the standard because the higher ups are not doing something. Mm -hmm. it, it, at the risk of your position in that hierarchy, you need to stand up and say, no, this is wrong. Had that Asian officer said, we're, this, this, we need to stop doing this, mm -hmm. George Floyd would still be alive. There, there are so many areas where we can make a difference. I, I, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that, that, that the people in this room, the people who are listening, you are the ones that we've been waiting for, quite frankly. And the silence is uh, what we need to change because it, it is, it, it, it's important that we change the dynamic, we change the model, we change the, the, the balkanization and get to know one another because we are stronger together. There's no question about it. Um, I, it but it is not easy. Mm -hmm. And there will be pushback. But, but uh, I, I've seen it happen. Mm -hmm. And I've seen people on, on this panel have, have seen it happen. Mm -hmm. Did um, you want to add anything, yeah. Angela? What's that? Did you want to add to what, they, what Michael had to say? Um, no, I don't think so. They said quite a lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then I want to give Linda an opportunity to ask her question. Speaking of balkanization, she said, well, she thanks you all for your insight, but in the talk about unraveling dominant racial narratives from the uprising, can you please talk about the presence of Japanese Americans in the very communities that were impacted? One of the dominant narratives that we've been talking about pitted black Americans against Korean Americans where do you think Japanese Americans fit in the narrative? I think they're actually played a very pivotal role in a number of ways. The most recent being the emergence of the Japanese Muslim Alliance that has emerged. Thanks to this new generation of young people that understood the history of the incarceration of people of Japanese ancestry, connecting with what they saw happening in the larger political discourse of this country, starting to move toward incarcerating Muslims. They came right out very strong. Also, I think because they had so much confiscated in World War II, there were deep friendships. I mean, there were certainly many who lost a lot, but there were also some deep friendships, and it was black families that stepped up in many instances here in LA black ministers who held on to property for families and took care of their businesses and gave them a place to come to when they returned to LA when they were being shunned elsewhere. I think also there's something about the Japanese culture that I think is quite notable. There is a uh, distinct, and it's unlike Koreans, it's not unlike Chinese, it's unlike the Filipinos, it's unlike, it's a uniquely Japanese, you know, quality, I think, which requires and expects a kind of refinement of anything you do. It is not good enough to just sort of do it right. You have to do it right, right? You fall short, and you could say that's OCD or whatever, but <laughs> I can tell who the owner is of a shop when I walk in, if it's Chinese, Korean, or Japanese. You know, there's also this quality. And can that, I ask, do you, or do you think this carries over to the younger, younger generations? Of well, sensei? no, the younger generation, I think, are um, a generation of people that grew up in a culture that said everybody's a winner, and that's not reality. <laughs> It's not? No, no just... it's not. I mean, I'm sorry, but I think this younger generation that I'm seeing, you know, they all think they're entitled to say whatever they want to say and injure whoever they want to injure. And I think this is dangerous because, yes. because, you know, I grew up in a generation that you had to compete, and then once you got to the table, you had to keep your head down and do the work. I'm seeing a generation of people that think they're entitled to say everything and do everything, because they're all, they're, they all count. There are some people that do have different skills. Right. And I think you know, we get ourselves into trouble. But I just want to go back to the Japanese community. I'm so impressed 
by a couple of things that they've done as a community. First of all, they're smaller percentage, I think, than mm -hmm. almost all the other yes. diaspora communities, but they've had people in federal government, they've had people elected federal government, in state government, local governments. There, there's something about a bridging quality. I mean, we're, I don't see a Japanese person on this, a person of Japanese ancestry on this panel. The generosity in that way of expressing humility in a way that's not saying I'm being humble, right? It's just in the gesture, the invitation. And, you know, some Koreans take issue, I will say. They'll say, oh yeah, the Japanese, they, you know, smiling in your face and stab you in the back, right? This is a Korean thing because there's a particular enmity there. But you want to get into the us, them, and this, why can't we not pick out the most wonderful qualities? And my people, my Korean people, they have incredible qualities that never get the light of day shined on, on them, right? And one thing I want to add, too, is in my reporting, it's Japanese-American activists who are leading Asian-Americans in the fight for reparations for black mm -hmm. Americans yes. right here in LA, and I, I don't want to argue with you, Angela, about young people, but I do see a lot of the activists are young people working hand in hand mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with some of the you know, people who were not incarcerated themselves, but are the children of people who were incarcerated. So I, I, I just have to you know, say that you know, maybe they do feel like they can do anything and everything, but, but sometimes that confidence you know, gets... Uh, believe me, I was there. Yeah. And then what happens over time is you realize, you know what, you're not going to always get. But I like the, where the choices have been. Yeah. But they lose the sense of respect for the history. Mm -hmm. They lose the sense of respect for what other people have sacrificed. Mm -hmm. They say we stand on the shoulders of, but they don't seem to manifest it. Mm. I'm sure I'll get a lot of commentary. We can talk about this more. I mean, I'm not saying I'm one. Of, I'm, I'm unfortunately too old to be considered one of the young people, but I just gotta, you know, you know, say I, I have seen the uh, seen them do good work as well. Do you? Uh, I have another question now. It's from Honor Stringer. Do you think the way that the media responds to incidents such as this has changed since 1992? And I am bracing myself. Go ahead. I mean, I think it has. I mean, has it transformed? No. But I think that, given what I was saying earlier, that um, all those kinds of forces of resistance and contestation from people of color, um, from social movements led by people of color, has made a difference. And I do think culminating in the way that the younger generations are changing our political discourse and racial discourse, whether it's on social media or, um, you know, blogs or vlogs or whatever it is, you know, the new media. I do think that um, similar to kind of the general populace in LA, there is a greater awareness of uh, racism not being an individual issue, but being an institutional, historical, and systemic issue. And I do... I see that in the way that um, news is trying to um, understand, okay, so um, the struggle that black Americans are facing, the struggle that Asian Americans are facing under COVID-19 racism, et cetera, that's not just happenstance, right? That, that does tie into a historical legacy and um, that race and racism is at the centerpiece of American nation building and the American identity. And I do think that there is more awareness and acknowledgement of that. Now, do we still have enough, what I would like, progressive um, people of color in you know, the top news agencies or the top newspapers transforming things? No, and we've seen lots of blunders and, and lots of mistakes in that way. But I do think that um, we are in a unique moment. I do think this is a watershed moment. Um, what has happened, not basically with the rise of Trump, right? Um, the Tea Party kind of preceded it, right? Um, but the rise of Trump, first going after uh, Latinx people, the caging, the Muslim ban thereafter, right? Um, and then what happened with Kung Flu, um, and then mocking uh, BLM. Right, I do think that uh, that and, and all the political resistance that that created, the massive protests. I mean, you had someone in every U.S. state and some of the territories <laughs> protesting. Right, um, when have we last seen that? 
mm -hmm. right? And and so we can't um, underappreciate that. I don't, I don't think we can discredit that. We shouldn't. Um, and what's interesting is when we did public opinion survey um, in 2017 and we asked Angelinos, we said, do you think there will be another massive uprising? And most of them said yes. Mm -hmm. And it did happen, right, in the wake of George Floyd, but it was um, different in the sense that uh, this time uh, the officer was charged with murder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were found... They were found guilty. Yes. Found guilty. Yes. So, yeah. And when you went to Minneapolis, yeah. you saw Asians show up. Yeah. You saw white people on the street. Yeah. But uh, yeah, here, I think one of the things we need to brace for is the conversation around reparations, which will be coming out mm -hmm. very soon. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, it's not a mistake that there happens to be one Japanese American person on that commission yeah. who had the experience of dealing with the internment and reparations for Japanese Americans. So that experience, I think, will be very valuable. Now it'll be really interesting to see how the media covers the issue of reparations for formerly enslaved people, descendants mm -hmm. of formerly enslaved people, mm -hmm. and whether or not there will be more conflict mm -hmm. within the African American community. Mm -hmm. Because if skin color is the issue, then should immigrants be included? Mm -hmm. Black immigrants mm -hmm. who are very dark and are living in our world today? And no, there's a whole philosophical, political argument that's going to be surfacing. And we really, as Asian Americans, I don't know where we're going to stand. I don't know where younger generation who are perhaps more woke, what their analysis will be versus those of us who have watched the enslavement phenomenon occur in all generations across all societies. And, and just for folks who, um, just to what Angela's referring to is, is I believe the state State Commission on Reparations has a Japanese American member, and they recently came out with their, uh, I think, recommendation that reparations be uh, for specifically the descendants of the formerly uh, formerly enslaved folks, as opposed to the broader definition of Black Americans. Mm -hmm. um, while we have a little bit of time left, Michael, uh, can I ask you, uh, you know, to Honor's question? You have been able to compare the coverage, media coverage of the uprisings in '92, to you know the uprisings of 2020, uh, the protests um, for Black Lives, and how would you weigh, how would you compare the two eras of reporting? Um, I don't think it's as much reporting as it was the 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 the, the actions themselves. Um, what you saw was the entire world standing up and saying, "This is wrong," mm -hmm. and doing so for the most part in a peaceful manner. Yes, there were there, there was some looting, but the fact of the matter is, given the number of people who who were protesting uh, around the world, uh, if the, there was a different vibration, there was a different uh, response to what everyone knew was horrific. Um, the, the, this, we're living in a world now where you can find a radio station or a, or a, a, a whatever lead that you're listening to that tells you exactly what you want to hear. But you saw something different here. You saw people looking at this and saying, this is not right around the world. And you, uh, and, and, and we had a verdict that was the right verdict. And the, the, the people that are, uh, that are police officers that are being charged with this, we're not through with that. So uh, that's, that's going forward, too. The fact is that, as King said, the, the, the arc of justice um, bends slowly, but it bends toward um, I, I'm getting it all wrong. But you, understand, you, you know the quote that I'm talking about. And the fact of the matter is, uh, we are moving in the right direction. Uh, we are moving in the right direction because of the voices of the people on this panel and the voices, uh, th th these voices are being listened to. Um, we had an insurrection on, June, on January 6th. And there is no, and, and looking at that, you see, it doesn't take that much to rile up 
a group that wants to do harm. And those groups are out there. And those groups are, are not going away. But the fact of the matter is, what you saw in the aftermath of that was people pushing back. You saw people being happy about the fact that this officer was, um, was finally convicted. Uh, but there were a number of people who, a number of officers who were um, tried for various other, and I will say crimes, who were not convicted. And so we, there is still a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. We celebrate the victories, for, we, but we don't spend a whole lot of time celebrating them because we have to go back to work. And if we don't go back to work, we'll slide backwards and, and, and not move the way we should. I mean, going back to what we were talking about earlier about the consent decree that LEPD was under after um, the, the it, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it, after that the consent decree was over, the number of African American officers being hired dropped significantly. Mm -hmm. So we have to be vigilant, vigilant about all of this. We have to be conscious about all of this. We have to be diligent, and, and, and we have to talk to people around us, people coming behind us, and we have to stand on the shoulders of the giants that came before us uh, in order to continue to move this needle uh, in the direction that it needs to be moved. We will do it. But um, we have to take it a day at a time. Thank you, Michael, for that. And if there are no more questions from the audience, I'd just like to give our panelists a chance to give some closing thoughts uh, about you know, their remembrances and also why they do, perhaps as a guiding question, why you are doing this panel, why you continue to talk about this. Uh, Nadia, do you want to go? Sure, yeah. Um, before I get to that specifically, I did want to add that um, you know, personally, I think one solution is also moving away from legalized state violence in any institutional form. And so I am somebody who advocates for moving towards abolition in terms of the police. Um, as many of you know, the police force actually came out of uh, patrolling of enslaved people. Um, and uh, that same kind of violent origin, right? Um, history is meant to protect the system and meant to protect um, white supremacy. And, and I, I believe that that also goes for the military. And I think all people of color, Asian, black, Latinx, indigenous, Middle Eastern American, et cetera, who are part of those institutions of legalized state violence might want to just reconsider. Um, I know it's difficult because these are often the only opportunities offered to groups of color, but at the same time, at what cost, right? So I just wanted to... Um, make a strong statement about that because I think it's really, really important and it's obviously related. Um, as far as why I do this, uh, I do this because um, we need to learn from the past and allow that to help us vision for the future. And that's why some of the things I said were, they seem so high in the sky and they, they seem so unlikely, you know, and uh, it's like a pipe dream. But at the same time, like I said earlier, you know, I never thought I'd see people of color in the Oval Office <laughs> or as, you know, not that that's the panacea, but, um, you know, I never thought I would see uh, people who are openly socialist and challenging uh, capitalism or people who openly challenge white supremacy being uh, elected into formal political office. Um, I never thought I'd see the day where uh, the entire country, territories, and the entire globe, as Michael pointed out, um, including Korea, right, um, since we're talking about Korean Americans, came out um, to fight for racial justice um, and against white supremacy in the form of police violence. So, um, you know, I hope that reflecting um, not just every anniversary point, right, 10, 15, 20, 25, but just reflecting every day, right, um, as Angela said, both internally, I think that's really crucial, but also uh, in relation to the collective, you know, um, and trying to integrate that into your day to day uh, as much as possible uh, requires us taking a moment, <laughs> taking stock. Um, and if we continue to envision better, then, then we will move towards better. 
Mm. Angela, you've been asked many times to speak on the uprisings. You will be continue to be asked yes, for years to come. I know. I surrender. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm just I, wondering, have you changed what you've said over the years? Not or had, really. I just read something. Some young journalism student, in fact, sent me a quote that I, I uh, wrote in an LA Times op-ed article 30 years ago. And it, it's the same thing that I would say today about, uh, about the divisiveness being used you know, divide and conquer. It's a really effective old tool. Mm -hmm. That's why it gets used over and over again. But for me, I mean, in answer to your question, I could tell you a story, and I often say, but I don't know if it'd be true, because time changes, people change. I'm grateful, actually, for those who choose to engage politically. I don't dance with politicians anymore. I think it's a broken system. I'm grateful to those who wish to fight on the streets and you know do whatever rights you think need to be protected. That's cool. Um, I'm grateful for artists and musicians because I think we are lacking beauty in our world. We are lacking love. We are lacking compassion and empathy. People, I'm even empathetic with the people that I don't like. Like you know, I, I have to be because it's like. It, I wouldn't exist if they didn't exist. My views would not exist if they, their views did not exist. And I'm trying to navigate toward, like, where is, where is it where we find ourselves together and realizing that, you know, our world is suffering. Literally, the earth is suffering. She's dying. Mm -hmm. And we are caught up in things that aren't going to really matter. And I'm thinking about generations ahead, you know? Our waters are acidified. We're wasting away the land. We are caught up in arguments that are creating more suspicion, doubt, fear, and delusion, which is, you know, the root of suffering for many people. You know, we're worried about not being able to house people here in the city of LA. We have tens of thousands of people on the streets, you know? And millions, tens of millions of dollars committed to, to try and house these folks. It's gone nowhere, right? And so we have to be realistic. People have their individual interests. And those are really hard to break through. So when somebody asks, what do we do? I ask, what are you capable of doing? Who are you? Right? Who are you? What can, do you have the courage? Do you have the time? Do you have the ability? You see, a mother of four kids can't do the same thing as me, who has no kids, right? Mm -hmm. A guy who doesn't speak the language and can't navigate the system and doesn't have teeth, like Mr. Lee, who spent 25 years in prison, you know, he has to follow the rules at his halfway house that says, no, we're not going to let people bring in soft noodles because we don't let the rules here are that we don't let. This is the gentleman you're in. in your API black. He's one of the reentry guys. Yes. You know? yeah. So I'm just saying, there's no common sense left. Everybody's following rules and following. I, I see journalism as one giant propaganda machine for the United States of America. That's what it's turned into. And then you have 50 million you know, uh, channels, as Michael said, you can pick what news you want to hear today. And the cacophony is insane. Mm. So for me, I sit quietly. Mm. I really treasure quiet. And yes, I will continue to say yes, probably in between the, the watershed years. Mm -hmm. And I, I appreciate you know, the fact that I can participate. So Michael, you may have heard Angela talking about how the world is falling apart, and it is, it is in the sense that 30 years, you know, we're still discussing a lot of the same things as 30 years ago. Um, you know, police abuses, distrust of police, racism, racist policies, and on top of that, we have widespread homelessness and, you know, a growing gulf between wealthy and poor. So, uh, how do you stay sane, and and how, why do you persist in talking about this when, you know, the pile of problems keeps keeps piling up? Because we're better off than we were. Um, we are standing on the shoulders of giants right now. Um, I was born in Arkansas, Little Rock. Little Rock, Arkansas, when, when, when the Supreme Court said that 
segregated schools would, was um, illegal. The state of Arkansas shut down their public school system rather than integrate the system. Shut it down. Um, things are not perfect. Things are much less than what they should be. But when you look at the history, when you look at where we've come from, um, I remember seeing the water hoses being used against peaceful uh, demonstrators. Uh, we saw people being just uh, brutalized at, at lunch counters. We, we, we saw the, 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 the horses running over people on, on the Evan Pettis Bridge. We cannot sit back and say and give up because the people that came before us did that, had gone, have gone through a lot worse and pre prevailed. God is where we are. I cannot complain because I was accepted at Loyola Marymount. <laughs> and I was taught at Loyola Marymount by my upperclassmen. Loyola Marymount was, in order to integrate Loyola, they decided that they were going to recruit from Los Angeles Southwest College. So I walk onto campus as a freshman, and the upperclassmen, the, 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 the juniors and seniors, are grown men in their late 30s with families, and they looked at me and they said, I do not have time to get B's, okay? Said, I, I don't have time to play. This is what you have to do, and this is where we have to go. I'm standing on their shoulders. I spent 30 years at a prestigious law firm doing very well professionally. Why am I president of the Los Angeles Urban League? Because I have a debt to pay. And even with that, I am not doing half as much as the people that came before us did to get us to this point. Are we where we, we want to be? No. It is up to us to move the needle to the next level. The, 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 the trials and tribulations that the people who have come before us, that some of whom that we have talked about, when you think about what they did and they did and they did not stop they 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 left the groundwork for us to continue to move it forward we have an obligation to do that we have an obligation to bring those who are coming behind us listening to the wrong channels we have to tell them no that's wrong this is what you should be doing and what I have discovered is that they listen. They, they pay attention. They, they don't want to hear what I'm saying, but, they, they, but I hear them repeating it a few days later. Why? Because we are, we are doing the job that, that our parents and grandparents did for us. Um, I am optimistic, to be perfectly candid. The fact that we are not where we would like us to be, that's fine. But we are certainly further along than we used to be. Mm -hmm. Understand, I was, when, when, you, when you look at the museum in Alabama and you see the, the coffins of people who were lynched in this country and you see the, the, the the, the stone where slaves were brought and sold still in the, in, in the marketplace in, 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 in Alabama. When you, when you walk over the Edmund Pettus Bridge, when you, when, when, when you see all of the, 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 the work that has been done in all of our communities, we have nothing to say other than 
get up, dust yourself off, and do the work. Mm -hmm. And make sure that there's somebody coming behind you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, am, I am proud of what this panel is doing, what this panel will do, and what people coming behind us will do. Make no mistake, there is a black man from Georgia who is sitting as a senator in the, in, in the Senate. Mm -hmm. When was that going to happen? And the, and the other senator is Jewish. When was, this is Georgia. Both you and Nadia are very surprised by you know, who's been elected in your lifetimes. <laughs> But, um, but I think on, you know, thanks for putting things in perspective, reminding us of how far we've come. And I feel like on this note of light and, and hope, um, I want to thank all these wonderful esteemed panelists that have joined us tonight. Janum, thank you so much. Michael Lawson, Nadia Kim, Angela O. Oh, thank you, Janum, so much for putting together this panel. And thank you, audience, for joining us mm -hmm. in person mm -hmm. and online. And I want to hand it over to Joy Yamaguchi from Janum. Thanks, Josie, too, for your wonderful questions. They're oh. really thoughtful. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, I was going to say thank you, Josie, yes. as well. And can I have a round of applause from the folks that are here in the audience today and then also online? Um, thank you for sticking, uh, staying with us tonight, joining us today. Um, Janum is going to continue to have these conversations. We're really excited that we had such a, you know, remarkable and, and complex conversation tonight. And we're going to continue to have those around the 30th anniversary and in the years to come. So please continue to join us. Join us next year as we, next week as we celebrate our 30th anniversary with our benefit. Um, and keep tuning in online and, and follow all the work that all these wonderful panelists are, of course, going to keep doing as we we have this conversation in Los Angeles in the weeks and years to come. So thank you so much for coming tonight um, and get home safe. Have a great night.